Okay, so this is going to look at the genetics behind virulence factors. So it's kind of like a part two um, to virulence factors. And so we're going to look at um, how information gets, genetic information gets exchanged between organisms and also locations. Um, before that, we'll talk a little bit about plasmids. Um, and then we'll also talk about pathogenicity islands. So OpenStax textbook chapter 10 and 11 touch upon these aspects. Pathogenicity islands is mentioned. So if you do a search in the OpenStax microbiology textbook, it's mentioned, but it's not really defined. Um, so it's mentioned in like a um, example looking at Staph Staphylococcus aureus and methicillin resistance and pathogenicity islands responsible for that. But again, they don't really define what pathogenicity islands are and they don't <laughs> explain it. So I had to use some outside sources um, to provide examples for that. So um, this is a table that looks at genetic basis for virulence in bacterial path pathogens. Um, and so this is from a textbook that's um, an open source textbook on NIH site. Um, and so you'll notice that the date of this um, textbook is from 1996, um, so a little um, outdated, but it does summarize some of the at least then known um, virulence factors, the pathogens related to, and then what's it coded on. So you'll notice that some of these pathogenicity factors are coded on the chromosome. Um, so keep in mind with the bacteria, we'll have a circular chromosome with different genes on there. We'll talk about how those genes are clustered together in an operon so that they're controlled, usually they're controlled in sets. Um, and so this can be used to the advantage of virulence factors because by turning that operon on, you can turn on a number of virulence factors if they're on the chromosome. Um, some bacteria can also have plasmas. And so these plasmids are these small pieces of genetic information. So we'll also talk about plasmids. We can also get horizontal gene transfer through bacteriophage. So these are viruses that infect bacteria. And so they can contribute genetic information and that can get incorporated into the bacteria's genome. And we also have tra transposons. So transposons are also referred to as jumping genes. So these genes can move from one location to another, um, either from the plasmid to the chromosome or from the chromosome to the plasmid and in different locations within the chromosome. And then we also have pathogenicity islands. And so pathogenicity islands, um, they have unique characteristics that are a little bit um, you know, different than your quote unquote normal genes. Um, and so these um, areas tend to code for virulence factors or antibiotic resistance. And be they also are more mobile than other genes. And so this is an area of increased research. And so some of the um, literature that I'm gonna share with you is published within the last like five, six years. So again, um, sometimes a little bit limited in some of the textbooks. I got a little disappointed in the OpenStax textbook for not having more information on pathogens in the islands, given that there's such an interest in research in them. Um, so what we're looking at here is an example of a plasmid. Um, and so we can see how both of these bacteria have, have their chromosome. If we took that and opened it up, it'll, you know, it's almost like an elastic band that's coiled in on itself. Um, it would have different genes are essential for this, these bacteria to survive. Um, so metabolism genes, genes that are in the code for proteins that are important for like protein synthesis and all these different biochemical processes that are happening inside the cell. You notice that Bacillus anthrax, um, it has two different um, plasmids there. And again, these plasmids can code for pathogenicity factors, um, production of toxins. And so we can see these two code for toxins, but they could code for other things like antibiotic resistance and such. And again, if you go back to that previous um, table, you'll see how there are certain genes for different organisms that are found in the plasmids. And again, sometimes information from the plasmid can get incorporated into the chromosome. Um, sometimes it just stays in the plasmid. 
So this table looks at mechanisms for genetic diversity, so how genetic information can be exchanged between different um, organisms, prokaryotes, so how bacteria within their species can share, but even bacteria of different species sharing genetic information. So one process that's been is researched and looked at is conjunction. Um, and so for conjunction, this is where DNA, um, usually plasmids, are going to be exchanged um, through a pili. Um, the pili is a kind of straw-like structure. Um, it's made up of like same, similar proteins that would be found in the fembrii, but they join between two bacteria. And so then the genetic information can go through that structure, because it's hollow, um, to the other organism. So if you know, I was a bacteria and I had a good plasma, that, plasmid that allowed me to survive, um, coded for antibiotic resistance, I would share that. And so we would create this pill eye between um, me and this other bacteria so information could be exchanged. We can also have um, transduction. So transduction is where the genes are going to be transferred through a viral infection. Um, so bacteriophage can do this. So bacteriophages are bacteria, uh, viruses that infect bacteria. And so they can have genetic information that they've either picked up from other bacteria and then transferred to the next bacteria that they infect. We can also have transformation. So transformation is where um, bacterial cells will just pick up uh, naked DNA that's in um, their environment. And so we actually take advantage of this when we do transformation um, assays, experiments um, in the lab. So in the lab, you might have taken E. coli cells, you damage them slightly by heating them, it makes them more susceptible to taking up DNA, and then you incubate a plasmid, and maybe that plasmid codes for GFP. So you incubate those together, and some of the bacteria take up that plasmid, and then they it can express GFP. So it's kind of the classic example of transformation that most students would have done like in a cell bio lab or, or something along those lines. Um, or maybe the, the plasmid coded for XGAL. So those are some of the common markers that are on plasmids. And so again, um, this can also just happen in nature. So not just in the lab setting. So in the lab setting, we're controlling the environment. Um, so it makes it more favorable for transformation to happen, but this can happen um, in nature. And so um, this has been looked at as far as when bacteria are killed because of antibiotic exposure, um, they can leave their plasmids behind and other bacteria that are in that environment can pick up those plasmids and that transforms the bacteria from what it used to be to something new, a new genetic um, combination. And then we also have transposition. Um, so this is the transposons where they can, where DNA can be moved from one location to another location. So using enzymes um, in you can get these cleavings and then this jumping of genes to different locations. So this figure summarizes different um, horizontal gene transfers that we were just talking about. So in panel A, you see transformation. So again, there's this plasmid that isn't within inside a cell, but this bacteria can take it up and then can incorporate it into their genome. So you can see that that gets incorporated. Sometimes it doesn't get incorporated in the genome, it can just be a plasmid um, separate from the bacterial chromosome. In our middle panel, panel B, we have transduction. So again, this is where we have a bacterial phage, a virus that infects bacteria. It's gonna dock and then um, inject its genome, its genetic information. And in some cases, this genetic information has been picked up from another bacteria, and so it can be transferred to the bacteria that's being infected. And again, it can get incorporated into the bacterial genome. And then we have conjunction in panel C. So you can see that hollow structure, that's the pili, pilus, um, that's formed between these two bacteria. And again, we used to think that they had to be of the same species but um, newer data shows that different species can actually undergo conjunction with each other. And then they make a copy of their plasmid and then they share that with a neighboring, um, the neighboring, the bacteria that they've created this bridge with.
And then again, the other um, way that genetic information can be um, changed is through transposons. So again, trans transposons are referred to as jumping genes. So this is where we can have um, a single gene or a collection of genes move from one location to another. Um, this is not something that's unique to prokaryotes. Um, so eukaryotes can undergo um, transposons. They can have jumping genes that move from one location to another. And so translocation of your of a gene into another chromosome. We're talking about a eukaryotic that has linear chromosomes. Um, and in some cases, this jumping, this transpose, tr trans transposition, leads to an insert into a gene, so it can actually disrupt other genes. Um, so again, um, some examples, you know, Shigella is known to have these transposons, and they're in these clusters that they move these antibiotic resistance genes from chromosomes to plasmids because plasmids can be shared, chromosomes don't get shared. So this figure shows you the transposon um, and so again there's usually there's repeat sequences that happen that kind of can indicate where a transposon is and so you if um, we have transposon ACE enzyme it's able to actually undergo recombination so um, if you think about um, you know in immunology when you're looking at T cell and B cell receptors there's the reg gene so reg enzyme that allows for this recombination so tr transposon is similar to that in that it allows for holding the genetic information in place and then cleaving, clipping that, and then it can insert the gene in another location. And so you can see here how this gene, the transposon has actually been inserted into gene B. And so now gene B is not actually going to code for what it needs to. So in some cases, these transposons will actually be disruptive and can lead to issues. So as I'd mentioned, sometimes um, it's an individual gene that's correlating to um, virulence factors and sometimes these genes are actually clustered together and so for bacteria for prokaryotes what they'll do is they'll cluster genes that are similar um, or used for a common kind of function and so what they have is this operon structure so you can see here on this figure how we have a promoter an operator and then we have a cluster of genes together and this whole piece ends up being the operon. And so maybe this is related to metabolism. And so in the metabolizing of glucose, the bacteria would need a number of enzymes in order to break down glucose and metabolize it to make ATP. And so instead of having to go to different locations on its chromosome, it clusters those genes together so that when the promoter is activated, it turns all those genes on, all those enzymes are produced because the RNA gets produced for them, and then through translocation you get expression of all those different proteins, all the different enzymes. So again, having these collectedly together works great. Um, and these can either work as you know activation promoting or repressing. So sometimes these genes are always gonna is gonna be turned on, but you can turn them off through a repressor. Now, we see this in virulence factors, um, that virulence factors will be clustered together in almost like an operon structure, okay? It also means that if we have a transposon inserting into an operon, it's going to disrupt all of those genes, um, because once you can't code for one of them, because if you get a stop, right, it's going to stop the coding for all the other genes, so we can't make those proteins. So... Um, there's benefits for the operon structure, but again, in some cases, um, this can be um, detrimental. And then lastly, with pathogenicity islands, they have specific characteristics that help us to identify pathogenicity islands. So these are going to be DNA segments, usually between 10 to 100 um, kilobase pairs. So relatively small amounts of genetic information, and the genes are going to be the genes end up coding for virulence factor. So again, this could be a single gene or in many cases, multiple genes. And again, these tend to have, um, they can have genes that are coding for 
the um, transposonase so we can get transfer of the genes to different locations. Um, so these are naturally highly mobile genetic segments um, that can move to different locations. They generally, they're going to re reside in larger genetic units, so they're not found isolated by themselves, um, but they would be found usually within chromosomes, but in some cases they can be found in the plasmids or um, bacteriophage. So when we're looking at pathogenicity islands, they are going to be flanked by um, repeated DNA sequences. Also, their base pairs, um, the composition is different than the the rest of the chromosomal DNA. So the GC ratios are going to be unique to the pathogenicity islands so on the flanking. So we have our genes of interest and then flanking that. Again, if we look at the GC ratio, it's going to be different than what we would normally see in the rest of the chromosomes. So that indicates that we have a pathogenicity island. And with that, also the um, amino acid codons usage, that pattern um, usually, usually is unique to um, pathogenicity islands. And so because of this, researchers actually can look at a genome and predict whether we have pathogenicity islands present. And so there's a pathogenicity island database. Um, so that link is provided. And we're going to look at that. So in, that, um, in this database, what they've done is they've looked at um, blasts, so looking at sequences and doing blast searches. And then through data mining, running that through analysis, um, looking at those GC ratios, flanking the genes, they can predict whether that would end up being a pathogenicity island that's highly mobile in the bacteria, also correlating to path, um, virulence factors. And so this figure is from a source that's cited there, so I highly recommend looking at that paper if you're more interested in looking at this database um, and maybe you incorporating into your capstone project. Sometimes these um, pathogenicity islands have special features, and so there are pathogenicity islands that code to antibiotic resistance, so these are called antimicrobial resistant islands, um, and so there are a number of these that are identified, and so just outlining some of these examples, as I mentioned, the OpenStax textbook mentions um, pathogenicity island where we have this cassette that um, codes for multiple drug resistance. So um, Staphylococcus aureus that's methicillin resistant, so MRSA, usually has this cassette that codes for genes that are resistant also for um, penicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, um, all of these other penicillin um, class um, antibiotics, but also methicillin. Um, we also know that um, Salmonella has multiple drug resistance, and so this is due to these antimicrobial resistant islands. Um, so there's one that's been identified, um, SGI1, um, so um, Salmonella Genetic Island 1. And so uh, we, you can search if you isolate Salmonella from like an individual that's become sick with it, you can then, um, if you do sequencing, you can look to see whether this is present and indication of multiple drug resistance for that. Um, Pseudomonas um, also has these genetic islands um, that correlates to antibiotic resistance. And there's a number of other additional ones. And then again, um, some of these are also in that database from the previous slides. So hopefully this provides you with an overview of some of the genetic aspects of pathogenicity factors, virulent factors, how bacteria can acquire those um, and how they can share them with other um, microbes. And as always, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact me um, to answer those.